Considering the materials available nowadays, it's surprising that surfboard manufacturers still often default to using the traditional wood stringer, foam core, and fiberglass and resin wrap. There are a few companies, however, playing around with other options, and in this episode, we're going to explore those modern innovations. More commonly now at your local surf shop, you can find surfboards with alternative materials visibly layered within the outer skin. As well as the glass fibers we spoke about before, there have been experiments with many other types of fibers, including wool, hemp, woven bamboo, coconut fibers, and of course, carbon fiber. Carbon fiber has a huge strength to weight ratio. It's incredibly stiff, but can be brittle when compressed. Sometimes it's mixed with Kevlar to reduce the risk of shattering, becoming carbon Kevlar. Weight for weight, carbon soaks up more resin than glass fibers, but because it's so much stronger, you can use an infinitely lighter weave of cloth to get the same strength. There are a couple of companies that make pure carbon boards made with a clear resin, so the beautiful carbon weave is visible. However, there are a number of problems with carbon. It's very expensive, and because it's incredibly stiff, it means a pure carbon board has almost no flex, though again, some people do like this. Also, while its appearance may be aesthetically pleasing to some, the dark material can melt your wax off in warmer climates. Therefore, carbon is not commonly used as the sole material. Typically, you see strips of carbon being added in strategic places to help control the strength and flex of the finished board. The other construction that we see often is what the surfboard industry calls sandwich construction. SurfTech and Firewire were the first to find commercial success with this method, and more recently, companies like NSP and Torque have used this method to create enormously strong boards, making them popular with surf schools around the world. There is one type of skin material that is not a composite, our old friend wood. Wooden boards look strikingly beautiful, but it is a heavy material when used in quantity. Firewire have recently brought out TimberTech, a very light one pound per cubic foot EPS core, with a thin veneer of polonia wood on the deck. They are not solely wooden skins as they still use layers of fiberglass and resin to strengthen and waterproof them. Another material worth discussing is air. Quite a few companies and individuals have played around with making hollow composite surfboards like George Greeno and Solomon, for example. This is an interesting direction because obviously if you make a hollow surfboard, then it would be extremely light, but you do lose all the strength that would come from the inner core. This means that the skin has to compensate, most likely by being thicker or more clever, to maintain the overall strength. The problem with hollow boards is that if or when you pierce the skin, you may sink. With no neutral buoyancy, as soon as it's compromised, the board and perhaps you will drop below the surface. An interesting feature of a hollow board is the plug or valve system. When under pressure from temperature change, or if you take one up into an aeroplane, then you need a pressure release valve a feature of some of the original Firewire and Solomon boards and most hollow wood surfboards. On the subject of wood, there has been a recent resurgence in truly wooden surfboards. Originally, all surfboards were made as a solid piece of whatever native tree you were plentiful of. For the ancient Hawaiians, it was the koa tree. For the Californians, redwood. And more recently, the lightweight, fast-growing balsa and polonia trees. Innovation somewhat outgrew wood as polyurethane foam became a much lighter and easier to work with core material. But wood has made a comeback recently, in part due to the advancements in computer-aided machine design, but also from a desire to replace the crude plastics that have been the status quo for the last half century. Modern wooden surfboards can be divided into roughly two categories, chambered solid boards and hollow skin-on-frame surfboards, both of which were first trialled by Tom Blake in the 20s. Chambered boards are usually carved from either a solid piece of wood or from laminated planks that end up a solid piece. Material is then removed or holes drilled in to reduce weight. While this technique does reduce the weight compared to a solid wood board, chambered boards are generally heavier than skin-on-frame designs. Skin-on-frame wooden surfboards are made by laying a thin skin of wood over an internal skeleton, much like an aircraft wing. The rails are built up using long strips of wood that can bend around the surfboard's outline. These lightweight skeletal framed inners are commonly designed on computer and cut by machines, and created a new lease of life for wood. Wooden surfboards still need to be laminated, often using an epoxy bioresin and fiberglass cloth to both waterproof and strengthen any joints. The benefit to this construction is that wooden boards are more durable and less prone to snapping, and so have a significant longer lifespan than foam boards. Despite their hollow nature, the weight of the wood remains a problem, and when comparing two like-for-like -like boards, one in a skeletal frame and one in foam, these boards tend to finish around 30% heavier than a foam one. 
We know the added weight will decrease acceleration and responsiveness while increasing the energy needed to perform manoeuvres, but in certain conditions where the momentum is useful to carrying the rider through choppy water or across softer sections on a wave, then a wooden surfboard could be the best option. As we mentioned last week, the stringer's role is to add strength and manage the flex of the surfboard. Recently we've seen the use of both fiberglass and carbon fibre stringers, as well as PVC plastic and high density foam examples in a bid to reduce the irregularity in natural wood grain. The flex of a surfboard is becoming a more and more desirable quality to control, particularly within high performance shortboards, when the flexing of the board can be used to store and release energy through manoeuvres. And so some manufacturers have attempted to use alternative materials to create a more measured and repeatable flex pattern. A potential reason this hasn't been pushed earlier is because it's only in recent times that specific flex patterns have been pursued and discussed. The professional surfer and average consumer previously considered the shape and design of the external properties more important, but manufacturers are now moving towards where the ski and snowboard industry have been for some time in considering the influence materials have on the user experience. Getting a consistent flex pattern is now a priority, and so methods for adjusting and refining the internal characteristics are becoming more prevalent in surfboard design. Another change in the last few decades has been companies like Firewire and Futureflex taking the stringer and placing it in the rails, rather than down the center of the board, changing the way the board flexes, allowing more twist rather than flex along the length, similar to how a snowboard might bend. The end goal is the same however, whether it's balsa wood as found in firewire boards or carbon fiber as found in future flex, these parabolic stringers, as they're known, are there to stop the board from snapping when placed under high loading stress. Lastly, I want to mention something that's not really a material choice, but it is a method of construction that is allowing for some advancements in our use of composite materials. As we mentioned last week, with most of these materials, the fibers provide most of the strength, while the resin is used to bond them together but you really don't need much resin to do this. Vacuum bagging is the process of layering the resin wetted fibers over the inner core. A vacuum bag is then pulled over the board and sealed at the seams. When the attached vacuum pump is switched on, all the air and excess resin is sucked out. One of the great benefits of a vacuum bag is not just reducing excess resin for a lower weight, but also equal pressure is applied around the entirety of the board. This is particularly useful when laminating the sandwich layers such as balsa wood or carbon fibre skin. Equally, when laying a carbon strip down the centre of the board, it's hard to imagine, but the strip has a tendency to float within the resin, especially if it's only gravity holding the layers to the foam core during curing. So vacuum bagging keeps the carbon and any other layers tight to the board, improving the bond by removing air that could lead to delamination. The downside to vacuum bagging is the additional cost associated with the equipment. And although some of the equipment is a one-time purchase, there are some consumables involved such as breather layers to allow the air and resin to be lifted from the surface, and also release ply layers that provide a non-stick surface to detach the bag from the board. Often the materials are chosen for us when buying a surfboard, but with greater variety of configurations available, surfboard material science is becoming a much more interesting place to be. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.